Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst, a financial journalist, and worked in telecommunications research. Tonight, I'd like to speak to you regarding uh, the uh, Russia narrative and an alternate interpretation of the 2016 election history, meaning there are two arguments you can make about the 2016 election. One is that uh, Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump uh, for reasons that are domestically attributable. And the other is that this was uh, due to foreign intervention by Russia. And um, more and more of the traditional uh, skeptics of things like the Iraq War, the Libya War, uh, Vietnam, the people who have time and again uh, not drank the Kool-Aid in our media establishment are, none of them are really going for uh, the Russia narrative. But yet, this week in our Congress, a very warlike act was passed against Iran, Russia, and North Korea. And particularly striking because Russia is by far the biggest of these countries uh, in many different ways. Uh, and these sanctions uh, can affect European companies uh, or institutions buying Russian gas and oil. So to tax Russia in their main export and message of their main relationship. This causes two problems for the United States. One problem is that this will weaken our ties with Europe because I do not believe that the Western Europeans and Central Europeans view this uh, the same way we do. The Eastern Europeans are hyper paranoid about Russia uh, because they're right on the border. Uh, but uh, if, if these Congress people are wrong, and their version of events is flawed, it really raises the question of our entire generation of leadership is fundamentally flawed, especially if it turns out that this is obviously deeply flawed. So um, with that said, what is their argument? Their argument is that uh, Russia has been meddling in the internal affairs of an innocent United States and, and an innocent Ukraine. Uh, whose present parliament received less votes than the losers in the last parliamentary election because the vast, uh, enormous tracts of Ukraine, they were not able to uh, conduct proper elections in because um, they're in a state of siege. These are the, the east of Ukraine is traditionally aligned towards Russia and the west of Ukraine is traditionally aligned towards Europe and it has split along those lines. Although, admittedly, it's only a minority of the provinces of the East that are in hot conflict. But uh, hundreds of thousands or millions have fled Ukraine that are uh, Russian sympathizers for Russia. Uh, so we're told that Russia meddled in the affairs of the Ukraine in the United States. An innocent Ukraine whose government is currently highly ultra-rightist aligned coalition that, as many have pointed out, includes celebration of Ukrainian ultra-nationalists during World War II who worked with the SS and in fact were in the SS because the countries along the border with Russia that were fascist had their nationalist movements aligned with Germany. That's one thing. But Stefan Bandera uh, was a war criminal. He conducted pogroms and genocides against Poles and Jews and he is held up as a hero. It's a complex situation uh, because Ukraine had a nationalist with a gun trying to get rid of the commies. Uh, but he was doing it by killing Jews and Poles in allying with Hitler. <clears throat> and this guy is popular with many of the people in the Ukrainian parliament now. Uh, so either the Congress has it correct and Russia has made serious violations that justify uh, uh, sanctions attacking Russia's oil and gas trade, its principal export, uh, now, this could also lead to an escalation, of the, uh, an increase in the price of oil. Um, so it could have a, uh, a blowback effect in weakening our relation with Europe, uh, and it could have a blowback effect uh, of um, driving the price of oil up, so Russia not becoming a net loser in the process. But what if it is incorrect, and who has problems with this Russian narrative? So, uh, the list that I compiled for tonight, the essential argument is 
these these people who have consistently been right on all these different issues. So what we've got here is we've got the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, and that article uh, they have discovered that uh, if we were dealing with the Russian accusation being based around Podesta uh, uh, email leak, DNC email leak, they show that there were two thumb drive transfers, one uh, in early June roughly, and the other definitely on July. Fifth, approximately, and their argument is that um, the first was the one who ended up handing him off to WikiLeaks. The second was actually a frame job where they planted Cyrillic characters into the documents to make it appear like it was a uh, Russian hack. So they were there was a real concerted conspiracy to frame Russia. Now, if this were true, uh, our Congress's vote this week uh, would be absolutely. Uh, uh, a, uh, a mockery, a travesty, a joke, uh, and an uh, outrage. Obviously, if in fact it was an internal leak to WikiLeaks, Russia was not involved, this kind of a declaration against Russia, along with the moving of arms to their border, uh, means we have an insane government, in my view. So we've got John Kiriakou, uh, we've got Ray McGovern, Colleen Rowley, uh, William Binney, a uh, former IBM program manager who people seem to take a look at, Skip Folden, um, uh, you know, uh, let's see here, Eddie, Anne Wright is fairly famous dissident. So these people signed off on this letter uh, challenging the, uh, the Russian narrative and establishing that it appears likely that not only was it a leak, but that the DNC took active measures to frame uh, Russia through uh, the Guccifer 2.0 uh, or something similar um, by planting Cyrillic on these documents when they released them. So that's the, uh, the one of the more recent reports. The other report, which I won't play for you now, you can watch it yourself later, is Matt Taibbi uh, talking about the insanity. Uh, so maybe we should just look at Matt for one minute so you can get a sense of what he's talking about uh, before we just dismiss it. Matt Taibbi is a uh, lived in Russia for many uh, years. So he and there was never any fan of Putin at all. So what he says counts a lot because he was... Uh, Matt, welcome. Let's go ahead. All right, so I want to start off by saying that I think it's difficult to have a sober conversation about Russia these days, uh, given that there's such an underlying assumption in media coverage that any dealings with Russians, any conversations with Russians uh, are likely nefarious or at least uh, questionable. But I think we should attempt to try, to try to break down some of these stories here. And let's start with what Trump was talking about in that clip there from the Times. Uh, he's referring to Donald Trump's, uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s meeting with the Russian lawyer and also his uh, conversation with Putin, uh, likely about the Magnitsky Act. And you write in your latest piece for Rolling Stone that there's no way to understand what's going on right now uh, without first understanding the Magnitsky affair. Can you explain it for us? Sure. Well, first of all, just backing up, if you remember uh, the Romney-Obama race uh, of 2012, you might remember this moment in the, in the debate when Romney said that Russia was the greatest uh, threat that we face today. And Obama responded that the you know the 80s want their foreign policy back, or the 80s call they want their foreign, foreign, foreign policy back. So at that time, it, it was the consensus, really in both parties, that that Russia was not a grave geopolitical threat. Um, but uh, interestingly, just a few months after that moment, after that debate, um, uh, Obama signed into law this this thing called the Magnitsky Act which set in motion a series of events uh, that, I, you know, in my opinion, precipitated the steep collapse uh, of Russian-American relations. And the Magnitsky Act, it's, it's complicated, but essentially it's a response to an incident involving an American billionaire named Bill Browder, uh, who had um, a couple of companies raided by uh, some Russian thugs, um, and one of Browder's employees was in prison, this guy, Sergei Magnitsky, he died in prison, and the United States retaliated by uh, creating a, a regime of human rights sanctions 
uh, that they called the Magnitsky Act. And the Russians were very offended by this act uh, because they believed that it singled out Russia um, as, as, a, as a human rights abuser when, of course, they exist all over the planet. And they retaliated by banning uh, adoptions of American children. And that sort of led, snowballed and led to the, to the uh, awful relations that we have now. You know, Matt, um, you mentioned uh, that 2012 debate between, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, 2012 debate between uh, Romney and Obama, uh, and the mood there at the time from the Democrats is being quite different from now. Glenn Greenwald recently uh, tweeted out uh, a tweet from the Democratic Party from back then, and he said, I think this is my favorite tweet in the history of Twitter, because it said from the Democrats, Romney, who calls Russia our number one geopolitical foe, doesn't seem to realize it's the 21st century. Hashtag Romney, not right. Me. So, yeah. as you know, a very different tone uh, than we're seeing now. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, just, just to comment on that quickly, you know, again, I, I lived in Russia for 11 years. I was there uh, when, uh, during the transfer of power from Boris Yeltsin to, to Vladimir Putin. And this all these different iterations of attitudes towards uh, toward the, the Putin regime are kind of mystifying, you know, for, for, for the people, for those of us who live there, uh, and, you know, I was an early critic of the Putin regime, most of us have kind of had the same attitude towards Putin throughout. We, we've all sort of thought he was a, a dangerous autocrat uh, who, who was a human rights abuser, but then again, so was his predecessor, Boris Yeltsin. Um, but... The, the attitude towards Putin from the political consensus in this country is what's changed. He's, he's been the same, basically, nefarious character throughout. It's just that, uh, you know, back in 2012, the Democrats didn't mind him so much, and now they do. And, uh, and it's, it's just interesting, that shift in attitudes. Okay, and so on the Magnitsky Act, uh, you note in your piece that... Um, you had a similar experience to what Donald Jr. described as being the outcome of the meeting. He says he thought it was inconsequential because uh, they were promised. Okay. So uh, that's a little taste of Matt Taibbi, a little longer than I expected, 6 minutes 11 seconds. Uh, Colonel Lawrence Wick Wilkerson, who I think is at the College of uh, William and Mary. Um, He's a very famous guy. I've got a link about him questioning this whole narrative. Stephen Cohen, the famous um, Russologist. Uh, so none of these guys have uh, said that they've seen anything they can believe. Uh, I've got uh, Mearsheimer, who is a dean of foreign policy in American academia and the Realist School. He's more concerned about China than Russia. When you listen to him talk, uh, he's concerned that our aggression or uh, hostility towards Russia could drive a Sino-Russian alliance against us. Um, and he doesn't buy any of this uh, uh, Russian narrative. Uh, John McAfee, the famous founder of uh, a McAfee antivirus, uh, t deconstructed and completely shot apart the intelligence report by showing that these descriptions of fuzzy bear and uh, cute bear, whatever the devil they call them, are really descriptions of tool distributions on the dark web is the way he looked at it. So it's really nothing to do whether you were with the Russian government or not. It's what version of software it is. Uh, and he wasn't buying that they uh, forgot to use their Western keyboards and forgot to set their hacking equipment to the Western time zone on what would be the most important hack. But the key thing is to focus on the people that claim they have evidence that it was an internal leak. because, But the point is that if you go through this list of people, Matlock, he was a Reagan ambassador, he doesn't buy this. Uh, Fair has an article about how this is choking the oxygen and essentially providing a smoke screen so that we aren't really focused on all the egregious things Donald Trump is doing on a public policy in the United States. This enormous military budget, which is vastly beyond what we require, uh, and uh, there's absolutely no reason it should stop Trump from going out and negotiating arms reductions globally. But they view this as a form of jobs, which is an obscene obscenity that you would promote uh, creating uh, engines of murder and death as a jobs industry. Uh, this is a last resource industry. It's a recourse to prevent 
our being aggressed upon. It's not a business to be profited from. We can find you other tools and toys to work with to make money besides murdering people. Um, so the, one of the most interesting of these is uh, this recording from Cy Hirsch that came out today. Uh, let's see if I've got that in here. Um, and this is just mind-blowing. So Cy Hirsch maintains that Seth Rich was in touch with Lucky Weeks, and it is in the FBI report, and he had a high-ranking official pull the report and check it and report to him. And the report indicates that Seth Rich asked for money, and the report and information he had indicates that he was a victim of a petty crime. But just because the police state that they have re no reason to believe it wasn't a petty crime, uh, that doesn't mean it was a petty crime, but what we do know is that if Cy Hirsch is to be believed and his contact is to be believed, that we have a direct linkage now, a linkage that's been hinted at by Julian Assange at WikiLeaks. Julian Assange at WikiLeaks can tell us who the leaks came from. What are they mad about? They're mad about WikiLeaks. Are they mad about Russia going in and reading the vote tallies on every uh, voting machine in the United States? Are they actually accusing Russia of changing vote tallies? I don't think so. So all of this is just noise. Uh, if the Russians read our voting machines, uh, uh, it is, uh, it's just noise in this conversation. Uh, unless they uh, uh, changed votes uh, or, uh, or there's some clear evidence, it's a total smokescreen. The real question is who provided the DNC leak and the Podesta email leak. There's one leak to the DNC. Uh, and so what I would maintain is that there's enough damage from Hillary Clinton's mails from the server that neither of these were decisive events. So the most decisive event in the election was her choice of Tim Kaine, which was sort of a big middle finger to the left, although she did adopt many of Bernie's policies and moved much closer to full edu public education. Uh, she was willing to do it for community college, I think. Uh, so at any rate... Uh, but uh, it's very meaningful who you actually surround yourself with. And she didn't surround herself with progressives. They were still too much bad blood. Um, so Cy Hirsch let that bombshell drop. Uh, the, now, the, the UK ambassador Craig Murray has claimed he received these handoff in a forest, so to speak. Uh, so he had some sort of correspondence with somebody in Washington, D.C. for on the FWIC leaks. Uh, Julian Assange has never directly confirmed that. Julian Assange did say that Seth Bridge was a person of interest. And Julian Assange did say they did not receive the material from a state actor. Uh, and Julian Assange retweeted the Cy Hirsch statement, um, which is extremely meaningful. Uh, that for the, the recipient of the communication of, with Seth Rich, WikiLeaks, to retweet Cy Hirsch saying WikiLeaks was in touch with Seth Rich directly is to give their imprimatur on it. So uh, uh, so I look to my, uh, my champions of uh, skepticism, Chomsky, uh, in this case John McAfee just being a maverick analyst who doesn't s smoke the military-industrial uh, uh, stuff. Uh, uh, if he rolls over, that concerns me. I say this sounds like Russia might be involved. If Chomsky rolls over, that concerns me. If Cy Hirsch rolls over, that concerns me. If WikiLeaks rolls over, if Mearsheimer rolls over, if former Ambassador Matlock rolls over, if Dr. Stephen Cohen rolls over. And, um, None of these people are rolling over and saying they believe that the Russians did it. Matt Taibbi, if you listen to the rest of that, doesn't buy it. Dennis Kucinich doesn't buy it. Gavin Newsom. So that's the one other part I will uh, read you and then the break off to uh, make a separate part two. Joining us now, candidate for California governor, Democrat Gavin Newsom. He currently serves as the state's lieutenant governor and was mayor of San Francisco. Also with us, CNBC's Brian Sullivan. Good to have you on board, Brian. Um, so, um, 
say to the Democrats? Apparently, it's not so interesting wow. out here. But I'm I, not running it's great for you. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm just hypersensitive. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I'm very sensitive. Mr. Lieutenant yeah, Governor, let me run for office. Oh, let, 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 let me ask you. Running right now. We don't really have a whole lot of time. So yes. we're going to take a this really quickly. Because this is important. Obviously, the media is obsessed for good reason yeah. with the Russia yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, Doesn't do anything for Prosecutors, Democrats. thank you. At that's, all. that's where I'm yeah, talking. One of could, our state houses you, back. Could you on? explain to Democrats out there and your yeah. base how talking about Russia on the campaign yeah. trail is not going it's to lose it back in power? And I don't know what more evidence you need. I mean, the end of the day, at the end of the day, even if you game this thing out, you get rid of Trump. Right. You're left with a guy who's you know who's out there talking about conversion therapy. Don't right. do anything. Right. for the Democratic Party in our agenda. So unless we deal with the issues of economic anxiety, cultural issues in a substantive way, uh, and we get into how business, and we actually demonstrate with some acuity and strength uh, a, a clear conviction in terms of the fate and future of this country, then we're never going to take oh, back that these state yeah. houses. Yeah. Okay. So there you have it. My name is Please Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck and wait for part two.